This episode of the Music Tech Teacher podcast is brought to you by Smart Music. Still the trusted way to connect teachers and students, the new Smart Music is in the cloud, so it works with the devices your students have today. Best of all, you can use it for free. Learn more at smartmusic.com. You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher podcast, episode number 20. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm your host Katie Wardrobe from midnightmusic.com.au, the place for music teachers to get the help they need using technology in music education. It's also the home of the Midnight Music community where you can find music tech online courses, video tutorials, tips and personalised support. For more information about the community and a special offer for podcast listeners, go to midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. In this episode, I chat to Meredith Allen. She's a music educator from the States who has been using collaborative learning with her students and also in the professional development workshops that she runs with teachers. Meredith mentions a few great online resources during the episode, some software and other tools that you can use with your own students. And you can find a list of those resources with all of the links in the show notes for today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 20. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Now, today I'm joined by Meredith Allen. Meredith taught for nine years or so in a rural district in Iowa, working both in instrumental music teaching and technology integration, covering high school virtual reality and elementary computers. She later on moved to a role with a state-funded area education ed agency where she was an instructional technology consultant for 17 districts, which sounds like an awful lot of work to me. And during that time, she stumbled across Soundtrap, which is an online music recording and editing software program, which um, I find is really great. It's one of my favourite things that's come out of the last few years of technology development. So it's something I've been using a lot in workshops as well. And Meredith, uh, since discovering that, she's uh, become a full-time Soundtrap education ambassador. I also discovered that Meredith was in a commercial at one time with Alyssa Milano (laughs) from Who's the Boss? And that brings back a lot of memories and probably ages me (laughs) because I grew up with that show and it was one of my favourites. So Welcome, Meredith. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So how old were you when you did the commercial? It was actually just a year ago. Oh, it was only recent. I was picturing when you were a child. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, yeah, it was. It's a really long story. But in a short bit of time, I um, I lost a a lot of weight. And she is an Atkins ambassador as well. And so um, we got to meet her and she, um, yeah, shared the screen with me for a bit. Wow, that's exciting. Yeah, I had, um, as a girl, I sort of grew up with, you know, crushes in inverted commas on other girls who I admired, you know, like a a girl crush sort of thing, you know, you know, a girl. And yeah, she was one of those ones, you know, I thought that she was sort of good in that show. And I really loved that show. And yeah, it was one of the ones that we watched a lot and you know of course that was in the time where you didn't get to choose when television shows were on and when you could actually access them so you had to like you know know the time of the week and the day and and just watch at that time yeah so that all oh, seems yeah. really foreign to me anyway at the moment because you know these days it's just on demand everything's on demand it's just so crazy so that's really cool and congratulations on losing the weight then that's really good <laughs> thanks thanks so um before we get to soundtrack i'd love to talk more about soundtrack because I mentioned it, it's one of the things that I've been using quite a lot um, in recent times, you know, in workshops that I run with teachers. And, and you're very similar to me in that you work a lot with adults and do um, professional development workshops and, and things like that. But I'd love to talk generally about, you know, what you've done in the past in your previous jobs and, you know, the way you've, you've worked collaboration into that because, you know, Soundtrap is very much about collaborating and composing uh, with other people if you want it to, it doesn't, you don't have to. Uh, but I'd love to talk about that because I know you've got a sort of a strong collaboration theme running through a lot of what you've done over the years. So can you tell us about maybe the early days when you were doing uh, band teaching and instrumental stuff? 
Yeah, absolutely. And so I was a a band teacher at a small school. We had um, fifth through 12th grades, which is all of the kids. I started them and then I got to see them graduate, which was awesome. And, you know, to tattle on myself, I was fairly traditional and my program was was successful, but um, I I didn't really know what I was missing until I had a moment. And it happened um, towards the end of of teaching in the public school I, we had a concert and it was the end of the year culminating concert. And, uh, we did a, an entire piece, uh, with all of those kids. So I had about 52, um, fifth through 12th graders and we played junk funk, which is, if you don't know it, it's Kevin Mixon. He, and it, it was fun cause the kids got to play in garbage cans and all that jazz and they, you know, an audience favorite. And I had, um, recorded it, uh, like I usually do. And, and that night I had posted it on YouTube, well, I'd, I'd uploaded it on YouTube and then posted it on our Facebook page. And like I, you, you know, that was common practice for me. So the, you know, grandma and grandpa who didn't make it could still watch. Yeah. And uh, a few days later, I get an email in my inbox from Mr. Mixon, the composer. <gasps> and I'm not sure how he found it, but he had stumbled on the video. And, and it was basically just a really nice attaboy message saying, great job, Lorenz Marathon Band, you're, you're doing great. Keep doing awesome things. I can't wait to hear more. And as a director, you know, that's one of those like moments where you cherish because it's like, oh my gosh, like the composer reached out to us. That's awesome. Uh, but really when I told the kids, uh, the next day at school, I watched their faces and it was absolutely moving because they had now, so when I read the email to them, they were stunned and I didn't realize the 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 influence that it would have on them uh, because he was from New York and he was kind of a big name in their war in their their small world. And uh, it was it was a moment. And I, I, I said to myself there, I want to recreate this like there's there's no going back now. I want this moment where the kids are their their faces were just excited and they, they were just so proud and I knew that I needed to start connecting my classroom outside of our little four walls in our school. Yeah. And so at that moment, it was like, from now on, I'm going to look for collaboration, uh, connecting classrooms any way that I could to expand their their world a little bit more than what I was. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest changes in recent times, you know, with social media and being online and particularly I found in the early days of using Twitter, it was um, just so possible to actually talk very personally to famous people and to, well, famous people either, you know, worldwide famous, but also famous people in your own small world. And that could be anything really, you know, a famous, uh, you know, instrumental player, or it could be a conductor or, or something like that. And, and to just have that chance to to message them and, and maybe even get a response back. And I really admire the ones that do give you a response back. I think it's fantastic, yeah. you know, because I think they do realise um, the impact that they have, especially when it's students involved as well so so that's amazing oh and it goes so far yeah that's right yeah yeah, yeah just w- one little tweet or or a uh, an email message could could fuel an entire unit for for kids to keep going because yeah. they now have an authentic audience to to do work for yes and I know a lot of teachers have been doing that putting um getting encouraging students to publish online because that that's you know the, it's so much more meaningful if you're publishing online and getting that audience further than a field than just your classroom or just your school or even the parent community as well. You know, if you're getting further afield than that. I know some teachers, um, you know, a few years ago I was talking to teachers who had class blogs, you know, they'd have a main class blog and then each student in their class would also have a blog which was attached to that. And so part of their assessment or assignments was to publish blog posts on the, the class blog and because it's open to the world you know it was fantastic they'd get feedback from all sorts of people that they didn't know and that the teachers were saying that was the most mind-blowing thing was when it, it was comments from people they had never met before and, and especially if they yeah. were in another country you know that was even more exotic oh. and more exciting so oh that's yeah really yeah good. I work with yeah, I work with kids that that you know. I, I just uh, graduated one of my my kids, and she's never left the state, you oh. know, in eighteen years. And we're only sixty miles from the state border. Yeah, right. Wow. And, and that's just their life. And so, yeah, technology now is is it's an amazing tool to to you know rock these kids' world without them having having to spend money to go 
to these awesome places. They can they can experience it at home. Yep, that's yeah, that's right. And so have you had that experience again since that moment? Have you had contact with, say, other composers or arrangers of, of works that you've performed or anything similar like that? Well, it's interesting because I'm late to the game. Um, I was I was listening to a couple of your podcasts. Well, I listened to a lot of them, but um, uh, more recently, Barb and, and Amy's podcast. And Barb was talking about how she was very early in the game uh, with the, the tech in her music classroom. And I am the polar opposite. I am catching up leaps and bounds trying to to um, just, yeah, basically keep up. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting these people that that it, at one place. And then later on, I find out, oh my gosh, that's so-and-so like they wrote this. Yeah. And so it's, it's fun because then I kind of like, I, 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 I contact them after the fact. And, and now I have, I have actually got to meet them and have a conversation with them. And, and then, you know, that fuels me to, to do even more learning. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's been a fun ride to, to be able to meet and uh, work with some of the, the, the bigger players in, in ed tech and, and in music ed, uh, technology for sure. Yeah, and, and what would you say to someone else? Because I, I get this a lot, and, and you probably too. Too, I know. I know that the teachers that I've met, you know, around Australia and New Zealand and in the states when I've been, everyone's the same. In that, I think that there's a fear if you're not really into technology that you've missed the boat. It's too late. Um, the kids know more than I do. All of those things. I get those, you know, comments a lot. And I mean, what what would you say to someone who says that to you? Do you, do you feel uh. like it's too late for them? I mean. I know what I would say to that. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think that the ones that are, are saying that are asking to be challenged. I think that that's an invitation for them to, to, to rise to the occasion. And, and, and it's, it, and I, and I always respond with the same thing is that when they say, you know, the kids know more than I do. And I'm like, that's awesome because that means they can take that moment and be the teacher, yeah, which I, I want that too. to happen all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I also say that the students may know more about the actual technology or they may know more about how to get their way around the technology, but they still don't know, they still need guidance on what to do with mm-hmm. it from an education point of view and that's where you know our superpower is as teachers is is doing that part mm-hmm. of it and and yeah I'm the same I, I I feel like I still came I came to it very late compared to Barb as you know the example we were talking about I mean I really yeah. did not use technology very much until I got a copy of Sibelius and you know that was in the mid 90s and that was the only thing I really used apart from Word and Excel <laughs> you know for a long time and yeah and I still feel like I'm quite late to it but you know, it's the thing of just staying one step ahead, really, at all times, picking up little things mm-hmm. here and there and, and taking on small um, bite-sized pieces of, of something new to do, I think, and, and testing it out. But but I think also seeing, like you did, seeing that amazing effect that it can have, one aha moment can really be a changing point. And it, it's yeah. such a powerful thing for you and the students as well. And so I know that um, you mentioned in an email to me that, you know, gamification of learning is something that you've used in the past and found um, found some success with too. And, you know, by that we mean sorts of things like earning badges or levels or or certain things for, you know, getting some progress in your learning through technology. So so have you used that? Is that with adults in your professional development type workshops or have you done that with students too? Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've mostly done it with adults and I don't, I don't usually tell them that what it is. Yeah. Um, I don't use the words gamification or badges because then I think that that almost has like, it's a turnoff for some, yeah. not all, but some, uh, but I've noticed that when I, when I do a model, um, uh, in a workshop that has, uh, a workspace that is open ended where, um, like for one example would be, I have tasks or you know, items that they should be able to do or or I want them to do and then have it leveled so that there's like a beginning, a middle and an end uh, and they can start anywhere that they feel comfortable. And then I also make sure that with those tasks, there's always some kind of support, whether it be a linked YouTube video for a tutorial or a website to check out, or sometimes it just, it says, ask your neighbor, you know, because I'll have collaborative work groups and, and, and I'll say, honor the experts in the room. I mean, someone at your table is going to know the answer or probably know the answer. So reach into that, that everyone has their own to bring to the table. Yeah. And so it's interesting because it lowers the, 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 what was my girlfriend's, uh, my um, colleague, Audrey always says, um, it, it, it's, it lowers the floor and it raises the ceiling. So it's 
easy to come into and there's no stopping how far that they go. And that's really successful with my workshops. Yeah, that sounds great. I, I, I use that thing about asking your neighbor as well. And, and I found actually in some workshops that I think some teachers are afraid to jump in and help someone else, even if they do know the answer, because maybe they're worried they're stepping on my toes as the facilitator of that workshop or Maybe mm-hmm. they're worried about professionally embarrassing the other person. So I, I make an open invitation at the beginning of each workshop day and say, you know, if you think you know the answer, I can't get around to everyone all the time. And so feel free to jump in and, and say, oh, I think you might do it like this. And, and that works really well and a um, great thing to do with students too. Yeah, really good. Excellent. Yes. And, and with other collaboration things you, that you've used, tell us about any, what, what are some favourite tools that you've used for collaboration? Um, so when I was doing my ed tech that was not music specific, uh, I was introduced to Padlet and uh, today's me as a, as a kind of a back channel um, opportunity for, for um, me to run a workshop, let's say, and then to have this conversation going on in the background that, that you know, offers additional resources, maybe a, an alternative perspective. Um, it could even be something as, as far off as two, two teachers found each other through this conversation happening in the background. And, and then it, and it led to a classroom collaboration between their schools because they, they found out that they both taught fifth grade Iowa history. Fantastic. Um, so I really really like those spaces. And it's a little bit like a private Twitter channel almost, isn't it? Where you're sort of chatting, people can chat, um, you know, throughout the day and, and you're in like a, a virtual room as such. So it's kind of a closed off thing if you want it to be. Um, so it can be private and then people can feel free to chat and share things there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then you can also, um, save the conversation too, as well, because there's so much going on, which it's nice to go back through and read and, and, and be able to reflect on that and then, and, and tie in the lesson yeah, later. And especially if when people share links and things, that's, um, I think there's often a panic moment where are we going to lose all this great information that we've shared? So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it can be yep. really good to yep. save it. And, and tell us more about Padlet. Padlet is um, one of those things that, you know, I, I heard about years and years ago and I've used it maybe a couple of times, but it's one of those things I tend to forget about. And since, you know, you've mentioned it, I'm thinking, yeah, I really, I can think of a couple of things I'm doing at the moment where it's probably the ideal solution. So tell people, well, for those that don't know what Padlet is, tell them tell them how it works and what it is. So, yeah. So the easiest way to explain it is like it's it's a replacement for all of your sticky notes, but a virtual space for that. So I think of it like as a as a whiteboard, and you can stick whatever you want on it. And so in the in the electronic world, in the computer world, that might be a video, that might be a file, that might just be a quick sentence that you type up. It might be a picture, um, but it can it can go. You can arrange it any way that you want as a facilitator. But you can they can just stick it on. They can put their stickies in a certain area. So if you say, okay, I want all of the the students in this group to post on the left-hand corner and then this group in the right-hand corner, and then we're going to go together and we're going to, you know, um, uh, review them. And then we're we're going to make a third pile. And, and so it's, it's, it's an electronic sticky board. I kind of think of. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. That's really great. And of course you can use it for workshops where you're just sort of gathering lots of information, but with students, you could actually um, maybe bring up some sort of topic. Maybe they're studying a specific composer like John Williams and movie music or something. And, and each one of them can contribute uh, stuff around that topic area onto the board. And, and um, you can create like a, yeah, like a, a bulletin board, worth of John Williams stuff, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. And and then it and then it's there always and, and they can refer back to it. And I've noticed that a lot of students in adults and in children, they I have some of my um my quieter ones are more active on these spaces because they, they aren't worried about, you know, maybe public speaking or um standing up in front of the class and they have an opportunity to, you know, type up their response or or you know, they're whiz at Googling. And so they're the ones that are just throwing in the, um, the resources left and right because they're, that's a skill that they have and and then they can really shine in those spaces yeah I love I love giving the opportunity for different forms of communication because I I was that person that was never that comfortable putting my hand up and saying things in class and even though I might have had an opinion or something but you know sounds ridiculous but 
you <laughs> other other forms of communication suited me better. Like writing stuff down was always a good thing. You know, when the teacher ever offered, um, everyone could submit an anonymous comment about this thing. Like that always really suited me because <laughs> I could just you know throw it oh, out yeah. there and and not be not be worried about speaking in front of everyone else um, or what people yep. were going to think of what I what I said or, or did. So that's a, a fantastic way. Um, I think it's it's great too because you can include uh, video links like you mentioned I think but audio files too is that correct yes yep yep yeah I think that's Absolutely. great yeah it's the the ones that uh, the tools that allow a big variety of um, types of media that are really really useful I think so I'm always looking at that because there's a number of different tools which are similar which allow you to do similar things and I'm always looking for the ones that tick all of the boxes that I want so video image right. you know text audio um, files as well maybe is it online like cross device yep yeah, absolutely cross device yes that's the other thing yes oh gosh yes that's that's a big thing at the moment and um, we'll probably get more on to that in a minute as well with, you know, Soundtrap and other similar music stuff. But, but yeah, Cross Device is, is such a thing and um, I've been working lately on a collection of, of lesson plans on, you know, using free resources that work on every device and that, that's always the, the key. I, I picked one thing and I'm like, yes, this will be great to demonstrate songwriting and then I realised, oh, it doesn't work on iPads, that's so not going to be so good. Oh, so, right, <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, I'll find a different option for that one. <laughs> this episode of the Music Tech Teacher podcast is brought to you by Smart Music. Smart Music is the music learning platform that allows teachers to connect with students as they practice. It makes it easy to create individualised assignments, hear student recordings, and provide specific guidance. Smart Music also empowers students by providing them with immediate feedback, both in terms of rhythm and pitch. This feedback transforms practice from passive repetition to active learning. The new Smart Music brings these resources into the cloud, so they work with Chromebooks, iPads and other devices your students use today. Best of all, you can use it for free with limited repertoire or access the full Smart Music library with an affordable pricing model that can be customised to fit any sized program. Learn more at smartmusic.com. So, um, so you said you stumbled across Soundtrap just by Googling. and that, This is how I find most things as well. I either see something on Twitter or Facebook. Someone mentions it in passing or shares something and you're like, oh, my God. Usually my reaction is, how have I not heard about that before? <laughs> and, oh, you know, I know. I always yeah. feel like, man, did I – like because you – often look the tool up like you might discover Soundtrap look it up and discover that it was um it started you know four years ago or whatever and you've only just discovered it now that, that's often happening to me and then people yeah. look to me and say how do you keep up with all the stuff you always seem to be on you know the latest things and I'm I think well I'm really not but as soon as I see something I do check it out and give it a bit of a try yeah. so so how did you stumble across it were you looking for something or it just happened to pop well, up as yeah a that's actually <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting story because um, so what does one do when they want to learn? They they submit a proposal to speak at a conference and then they get accepted. And then it's like, oh, maybe I should actually know what I'm talking about yeah. with this submission. <laughs> that's me every so time. So that's what I – okay. So mine was um, I, I thought, oh, I'll write up a quick description about um, global collaboration in music classrooms. And having a little bit of an idea of how I wanted to form it. But then it was accepted and I was like, okay, I really need to know what I'm doing. And I, so I, you know, I go to Google and I, and I, and I actually found some amazing things when I was prepping for that conference, but Soundtrap was one of them. And this was all oh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, and then I, you know, what does a teacher do? Well, they ask for free stuff. So I contact the company. I'm saying, say, you know, can I have, you know, 30 seats or whatever for my makerspace that I'll be doing with, um, this school that I'm working with. And of, of course, at the time, you know, was, I think Ashkin was there and, and he was like, yes, let's do this. I can't wait to hear the great things. I mean, they, they're so, I mean, the company, if you ever get to work with them or talk with them or have a conversation, it's, they're so open to yes. what's best for kids. Yeah, absolutely. They want success in our classrooms, bar none. That's their first goal with the EDU product and and so that was it and it the rest is history <laughs> yeah I, I had a, a pretty similar experience too and you know I had seen Soundtrap and I'd used it quite a bit and then I'm using it in workshops and I and then I 
you know, if you're doing um, what I call chalk and talk presentations at a conference where you're just talking at a group and it's not a hands-on workshop, you know, you only need your copy of Soundtrap to be, you know, working. It. But then I got to the point where I was doing hands-on workshops with teachers and I wanted to create the classroom scenario where they, yeah. were, they were the students in the classroom and we submit work and collaborate and share stuff. And, and so I, I did the same thing. I approached them and they were so open to helping me out with that. And it's fantastic because now I can really recreate what it would be like in the classroom situation and, and show people how that Absolutely. works and, and, you know, click a button and submit the work through and it's all just there and it's, it's just great and it works it's, so well. It's fantastic. Yeah. And it gets in, you know, it, it keeps getting better. And I love that, that the, if you don't know the history of Soundtrap, it was first just a consumer product for a digital audio workstation that's collaborative in the cloud. But then they found out and they got uh, like best teaching and learning award from <laughs> the the librarians association in America. And they were like, what is this? I don't know what wh- they're using us in schools. And, and so the EDU was really born from teachers and, and that's what they've, they've tried to honor this entire time is, is what's best, what, what can we do to make it easier for teachers to use in the classroom? Yeah, and yep. um, it was really interesting. I, I actually had a Skype chat with Frederick uh, the other day. Who's what's his position at Soundtrap? I've forgotten completely now. He's a um, co-founder. Co-founder. Yep. Correct. Thank you. <laughs> um, and yep. we had a great chat because I, I was complimenting him on the fact that Soundtrap, and you know, for those who haven't used it, it's it's very similar to like a Garage Band style program where you've got audio files, you can pre-made ones, you can use, you can click record and record your own voice or your own instrument through a microphone or you can um, play a virtual keyboard which might be loaded up with a clarinet sound or a string sound or, or something else so you've got all of those options like you do in GarageBand so but I, I was complimenting him on the fact that um, colour for me in my world is is a really big deal mm-hmm. colour, the colour of things and I said you know mm-hmm. Soundtrap's so different because it's white background primarily and it's nice um, colours it's pinks and blues and greens you know for the recorded uh, regions in your your thing that you're working on and and it's so different to almost every other well I think pretty much every other digital audio workstation that's on the market so every other one has a very dark background and it's and and Frederick was saying that was actually deliberate because they wanted to make sure that it was um, just as appealing and um, friendly to girls and women as it was to to males because a lot of the other programs are very testosterone driven I suppose in their looks and feel yeah. they're you know, very masculine looking so so I loved that and it's not girly by any means but it's just neutral you know it's just neutral it's yeah exactly and I and I like to say sexy I just think sexy, that the yeah. whole platform is very sexy yeah yep. it's very clean I think that that's the thing that I love about it. it's very clean so yeah so I've yeah. I've had some great experiences with it too and um and like you said it, it doesn't I mean at the moment it's um adding features in all the time it doesn't have everything so it doesn't it's not maybe as fully featured as a number of other programs that are out there but for most people that won't matter they don't need a lot of those extra features anyway and they're adding stuff all the time so I really I really like that yeah and so tell us about um what uh have you had a chance to use it with students or you've just been using it in I shouldn't say just you've been using it with adults in (laughs) workshops and professional development and that sort of thing so what have you been doing with those workshops in sort of examples of how to use Soundtrap Yeah. So I have used it with students. Um, I I do, like I uh, mentioned, like Makerspace, I had had an experience where um, elementary students would, um, they created their own um, composition. And these were non-music students and I only got them for uh, 45 minutes. And so it was just fun to hear and see all of the creations that happened from that, from that. And, and then I get a new batch the next 45 minutes. So it was, and just group to group was fun. Adults, uh, it's a little bit harder to get them to create. Uh, I think that, and me too, I was very traditionally trained. So I have that that moment where I kind of seize up a little bit when I have free reign. And so adults, I, I, um, I've i had um, maybe not as many crazy creations as the kids, but still some, some great things have happened. But I'd say that one of the turning points, well, not turning points, but, but encouraging moments rather, uh, was with my own daughter. Uh, the she and this is non music, but it still has to do with um, good teaching and learning and great things that we want in our classroom. But she had had a uh, her favorite author at the time was Anna Dudney. This was about a year ago, and Anna Dudney does the Llama Llama books. If you're, I don't know if you're I don't familiar. Know them, but they sound great. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Well, it is, I think 
there was a rapper that just wrapped one of the books and it oh. went it went viral uh oh, red pajama oh, so if, okay. yeah um you have to look that up I'll put yeah a link in the show notes. And, <laughs> and i want to say ludicrous but i don't know if that's right so don't quote me <laughs> um so anyway, uh, it, her favorite author was Anna, and about a year ago she passed away. And so we we talked about it in our house, and I said this, you know, she passed away. She knew she was going to die. She had cancer. Uh, she wrote her own obituary, and and we read it. And at the end of it, it says, um, in lieu of of flowers, please just read to a child. And and Morgan, she's my eight year old. She feels everything with every emotion, and she said, Oh, mom, can we read tonight? And I was like, Absolutely. That's you know no problem there. <laughs> And so when we sat down that night with her book, um, I, I thought real quick, oh my gosh, I need to capture this. And so I had my cell phone and I had the, you know, I was like, oh, I always talk about this, this awesome app that does quick records, but I never actually do them. And so I was like, I need to do a quick record. And so I grabbed the Soundtrap app or I opened up the Soundtrap app, did, did the quick record. Morgan um, read her, her story and I, and that night after she went to bed, I, I added a little bit of intro and outro music and faded it in and not much. I mean, maybe two minutes tops. But the next day I, uh, I had her listen to it and I couldn't, I couldn't hear what she heard because she had headphones on. But I knew the moment she heard her voice <laughs> because her body reacted. Her shoulders went back. Her eyes got big. She smiled really big. And there was this pure moment of just like proud. I created this. I, I, this is me and, and I want more of that. And so as a mom and then as a teacher, I was just like, yep, I'm, I'm on the right track. I'm providing uh, support for use of these tools in the classroom because this is, these are the moments we want our students and our kids to have because yeah, so uh, cool. it'll keep them going. Yeah, yep. absolutely. So cool. And just capturing that is great. And um, yeah, the idea, I think that it's, instantaneous nowadays the technology allows us to be in the moment and just do things like that really quickly and video or recording it's just so fabulous for that sort of thing and I think um, like Frederick and I were talking a lot about the non-music teachers who are using Soundtrap and <laughs> podcasting is a massive thing that they're doing with students and I, I love suggesting this as a you know as an assignment option you know you can take pretty much any research type assignment and rather than students submitting an essay to you um, they can create like a radio show which is essentially a podcast and record something instead so similar to, to reading the book through they can just record you know their their information and facts about John Lennon that they've been studying and then put that together maybe with some examples of his um, songs and you know and other stuff around that so I think Frederick was saying that's how a lot of teachers are using Soundtrap in the classroom. Yeah. And I think the major, like the majority of our teachers are non-music teachers, which is very interesting. Yeah. But once yeah. you start thinking about it, like in the music world, they say like, I don't know, um, 70% of, of adults wish they would have played an instrument I know. at some point, but never did. <laughs> and, but they're very musical. They just didn't do, they didn't get that, that training, the, chance, um, yeah. the technical training or they weren't, the creativity wasn't fostered. And I had, I had classmates that I was so jealous of their skills because they could sit down at a piano and not ever have had a lesson and be able to play. Yes. Uh, and I had like 11 years of piano and I still couldn't play half as good as them. And yet they weren't, they didn't go through with music because the system didn't really allow for them to continue that. Yeah. And so just like with, um, the podcast piece, you know, we have kids that struggle with writing and, and, but they're very, very bright and there's a lot that they need, to, they want to say. And now they can speak what they're thinking and, and their thought process through the learning instead of being worried about the red marks that they might get, you know, on the, the grammar. Yeah, I love that. Um, it, it works really well for that differentiation approach, you know, in, in terms of um, offering different ways for students to submit work to you and it goes back to that thing we were talking about you know different ways of, of maybe contributing to a class discussion like we were talking about earlier and this is another yeah. great way of just contributing something and you do discover that you know students or, or adults in my workshops you know the the very surprising skills that people have or special talents that come out with things like that you know suddenly I find there's right. like one awesome rapper in the room and, you know you would never ah, have known to oh, look I at know. the person <laughs> uh, yeah so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've, the I've, brain is so interesting. Yeah. I know, I know. And I, I've done that thing too. I've worked, I've worked, done quite a lot of workshops with non-music teachers, but I've run music-based sort of workshops. So I've you know, done things like, um, 
you know, the fact that you can create your own intro and outro music for radio shows that you're doing with your writing class, you know, that, that sort of mm-hmm. exercise. And that's been really good too. And once the, once the teachers have seen just a bit of structure and a bit of a format or a process to go through using something like Soundtrap, you know, if you give them a little bit of a formula, it's like, oh, that's so easy. You know, it's not hard to do that. And and I start even with really simple things like just grabbing a ready-made loop from the loop library, dragging that in and showing them how to create a fade-in or a fade-out, you know, and they're like, wow, it sounds like a professional radio show now where the music fades right. out underneath the voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. And 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 we, we had a a feature come out. Oh, I think it's been almost a month now that they can, you can have your own preset. So you could, you could create your own loop and then save it. And it's always your loop. Yes. And so I think about like radio shows, that would be great if you, you know, like Foley sounds, um, a door closing or a bell ringing or something like yeah. the kids could be, they can create those sounds and then they, they can be in their library forever and, and, and tap into them. And, and yeah, I, I, there's so many possible, I just get ahead of myself thinking about all so the possibilities. <laughs> You yeah, see yeah. my um I, I keep ideas in well, I used to keep them in Evernote, you know, Evernote um I used to store a lot of text I like ideas for blog posts and things like that. But um I've I've sort of moved away from that and I'm using Google Drive now a lot for everything pretty much. Yeah. And so I save um, you know, Google documents with uh, lists and lists of ideas of how to use certain software tools or, you know, lesson options and, and that sort of thing. And yeah, I, I have far too many ideas than I can ever mm. actually use. It's really hard. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, get it's them all fun. Out there. And what yeah. other collaborative uh, music software tools have you used or, or suggested going back to that, that presentation you did at, you know, the, the conference uh, earlier about yeah. collaborative music tools? What else did you cover in that one? So I get that question quite a bit, actually. In my, it, well, I did when I was an instructional technology consultant because they would hear, oh, you're a music teacher. Uh, I have a music teacher that's wondering about technology. And, and I... I Maybe this is my own belief, but I the music ed world is a bit behind with technology. Yeah, I think so um, too. <laughs> I think so. A, as a whole, yeah. yeah, nothing against us at all. It's just we're I just a little a slower time, to the game. Yeah, and a lack of time thing. You know, you, you're so caught up with putting the concert on and um, you know, yeah, running auditions or whatever it is. And yeah, but we're ahead of the time. game with performance based assessments. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, that's right. Um, yes. Project based. Yeah. But anyway, um, the, so I get that question and they'll say, what, what should I recommend to my music teacher? And I'll say two things, two pieces that every music teacher should have is a, well, and it's, it's a given that it needs to be online and works on all devices for me. I won't recommend anything, but especially in school situations is a, a, a DAW, a digital audio workstation, which right now, as far as I know, Soundtrap is the only one that will work on all devices across all platforms and a notation software. And yeah. right now I have, I kind of go back and forth between Noteflight and Flat. Those yeah. two, I'm, I, I, I love them both. Yeah, and no, I, I, so I like recommend to- uh, Noteflight a lot, but only maybe because it's uh, been around a bit longer than Flat and is a bit more fully featured. But yeah, Flat's mm-hmm. coming up there as well and both online tools. And yeah, I'm, I'm the same pretty much. I, I do recommend both of those as well. And, you know, again, they're not, they don't have every bell and whistle, but most of the time the teachers don't need those or the students don't need those anyway. So they're just fantastic. The fact that they work across all the devices is just so good. And, and I love, oh, yeah. I just love that idea of, you know, you can start your composition on your your Mac laptop that you've got and then you go home and then you might continue it on your iPad at home and then you might go back to school and you work in a computer lab, which is PC computers, and you log in from there. Yeah. And, and so just logging in anywhere is, is the access to your total account and all of the things that you've been working on and it just makes it so much easier. <laughs> it does, it r- does. It makes me, I, I appreciate, I think I appreciate technology. I, I'm sort of thankful for the fact that I appreciate technology more so than for instance my own kids who are you know in grade five and six at the moment and they've just because they've grown up with it since they were born it was just around and you know they take for granted googling things or shazamming a song on the radio and and all of those things that we do all the time nowadays and I said I have to say to them you know things like in the olden days we just didn't do that (laughs) I said they're like didn't you just look it up on Google I'm like there was no Google there was no no internet (laughs) there was was no computer (laughs) it was yeah I hear you 
And they just can't yeah, they can't it's... imagine a world without all of that stuff. But I do I am thankful in a way that I didn't grow up with it because I am so appreciative of it now and I just think it's so amazing. The world we live in is so amazing, the fact that we can communicate with other people around the world instantaneously and and, um, and collaboration. I know I mean I know people with um, soundtrap particularly are collaborating with compositions, for instance, so a, a student in Australia might start a composition and they might write a bass line and um, maybe a drum part and then they might, you know, communicate with someone who's in a different country and let, let's say that's the States and then the other student in a different country can contribute their vocal line to the piece and they basically just log into the same project that they're working on and, and contribute that way and that's kind of mind-blowing. I mean, really, when you think about that, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, it's, and... and yeah, I, I mean, the easiest way to explain is if GarageBand and Google Docs had a baby, that would be it. I mean, it's just, uh, oh, I, I, like that. I think Tanya Averith was the one that, that coined it first. Yeah, she's she's awesome. Cool. And, I'm going like, to use that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's great. And and I just think, you know, um, I, I actually started a, like you were talking about your Evernote and, and your notes is, is I've went back to pencil and paper and doing a lot of sketch noting. And so one of my sketch notes recently is the the collaborations that I hear of through my work. And just an hour ago, I found out that there's one between an Australian classroom and a classroom in Holland. Oh, fabulous. And yesterday was Texas and Maine. And, you know, and these happen all the time. And I just think that's what I want for my own kids. That's what I want for all the kids to yeah. have that opportunity to learn because it's it's more than just learning uh, the content, but it's also learning a new culture. It's, it's, it's learning how to work with people. Yeah, yeah. Which is real life as well. And, you know, this is the thing I'm saying to my own kids all the time. You know, if you've got an issue with someone at school, you know, you've kind of got to learn to get along with them because in the real world, when you get to a job, you, that's the real life world that you live in yeah. and work in. And, you know, you've got to learn to collaborate with other people. And, um, there's, it's very rare to, to be in a, a job or a situation in life generally where you're really truly working alone with no one else you know you, you're pretty much always working with someone else you know, in everything you do and so to be able to start doing that and particularly with the creative side of things I think is really useful and you know you can get ideas from each other and things go in a different direction maybe that you weren't expecting and I, I think that can be really useful. Yeah, yeah, just absolutely. Great. And just lastly, um, with Soundtrap, have you worked with um, band, orchestra, choir type teachers who are using it in their scenario? And and if so, how are they? What are they doing with students in that that situation? Okay, so um, band, I have had a lot of teachers asking me about just the recording feature, which is great. Um, I think that that the the across platform is huge in that world because the kids can just do it on their phone. They can go into the practice room and record on their phone and then have that recording for the teacher immediately. Choir teachers use it. I, I They love being able to mute the, um, the different tracks and use them as, as rehearsal tracks yeah, and then share, sharing that. Yeah. Sharing that piece with uh, students to be able to go home and practice with that. And um, yeah, I orchestra, I have, I haven't had a whole lot of experience with orchestra. So yeah. yeah, probably similar to the similar to the band, I would imagine um, same sorts of things. Yeah, I was wondering if um, many of uh, those teachers are using it in a cre more creative compositional type way at all. I know the general music teachers. Oh yeah, you know, tends to be the focus, but um, yeah, but just for the the band orchestra choir as well, I think that's a great additional thing if they've got time to do that as well with their their yeah. class time and stuff. So. Yeah, so a lot of our schools have, um, well, especially in Iowa, we, we have what we call May term or J terms, where they have um, uh, like two weeks where they, they, they quit regular school and they just do project based learning during that time. Oh, fabulous. And uh, the music teachers glom on to that time to do their creative um, because they're very focused on the concert and finishing and getting, you know, and so during these two weeks, they can really dive deep into um, the technology that they might have put off or the kids being able to have that um, guitar class or whatnot. And so I see it during those times often as well. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I, I do a lot of um, work with general music teachers. Our, our music program's quite different here in Australia to the way it is in the States. And um, it's funny when I describe this to teachers who are in the States, they're like, what? Because <laughs> we don't, generally speaking, we don't have class time um, set aside for band, orchestra, choir rehearsals. So all of those things okay. take place outside 
school hours. So before school, lunchtime or after school is usually when the band rehearsals are and the orchestra and the choir. So so those music teachers are kind of fighting for their time a little bit and often competing with uh, other yeah. activities that students might be part of. And so our class time where we have music classes is is more like a general music class. And, and so okay. that's compulsory uh, for year seven and eight and then it becomes an elective option after that. So so numbers drop down quite a bit by year nine, 10, 11, 12. But, but yeah, it's quite different. So yeah, so the a lot of the workshops I do in Australia, it tends to be more focused on the general classroom sort of set up and um, teachers there. So a lot of project based stuff, like you said, you know, doing yep. the podcast things or the compositional things, and um, lots of fun. You know, video game composition. That's one I've been doing a lot lately. Yeah. And, you know, uh. I, I said to Frederick, I'm hoping one day they might have a, a video embedding option in Soundtrack because I'd love to do the yes. film scoring stuff in there too. But it's a little mm-hmm. bit hard at the moment. <laughs> one day, yep. one day, I'll put it on their wish. Well, my answer is that we're constantly evolving yes, and yeah, <laughs> there's, yep, yep. And, and they, they do. I just, yeah, it's great. Yeah, that's excellent. So good to talk to you. It's been really great hearing about all the collaborative things. And I, I think it's such a, it's kind of a different way of thinking, you know, when you, if you have a filter in mind or it's sort of a thought in the back of your head about the possibility or option of collaboration, you know, with, with students, whether that's within your classroom or just within your school or with a school that's nearby or even across the other side of the world, I think it's a great thing to keep in mind and, um, and, and sort of, you know, think about how you can use that uh, with your own students or, or even with other teachers if, if any people are running workshops with other teachers out there. So thank you so much for sharing all of those things. Yeah, thank you. I will put some links in the show notes for this episode and I will um, list the things that we've talked about and just put links to those and um, including that piece that you mentioned, the junk funk piece at the beginning that you mentioned and, oh, yeah. and everything else we've talked yes. about. I've, I've made a few notes as we've been chatting, so I'll do that. But thank awesome. you so much, Meredith, for talking. And I'm, thank you I'm for having gonna me. I'm going to look forward to chatting a bit further on Facebook and stuff. And I was going to mention also, if anyone's interested, uh, Meredith and I are both members of a Soundtrap uh, for Education Facebook group. I think that's what it's called, isn't it? Soundtrap for Education. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yep. So people could look that up if they want to join in and, um, and chat and ask questions in there about this and and anything else as well so i call it the dating site for teachers on soundtrap so they can find other classes to collaborate with yeah and it is because of that collaboration aspect it's a little bit different to other facebook groups that i'm part of which are still to do with music and technology but because of that collaboration yeah yeah, it's a i saw one i think that one you mentioned texas and maine yesterday or something yeah great yeah it's great Excellent. Great. Thanks so much. And um, we'll look forward to catching up with you soon, hopefully at an event in person sometime. Yeah, sounds awesome. Thank you again. Uh, No problem. Thanks. The Music Tech Teacher podcast is hosted by me, Katie Wardrobe. You can find more information and links from today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 20. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.